This program represents the second part of a series on introduction to virology. In this part, I'll be dealing with the classification of viruses and their detection. Viruses are classified according to their composition and structure. Initially, they are broken up into uh, two categories based on the type of nucleic acid that they have, whether it's DNA or RNA. No virus really has a genome made up of both DNA and RNA in the same virion. Uh, once they're divided by this category, then they can be separated based on whether they have an envelope and then by certain features of the organization of their genome and finally by uh, certain elements of morphology. So when classing a, classifying a virus, the first question to ask is, is it an RNA or a DNA virus? Then is it enveloped or non-enveloped? Then is the nucleic acid single or double-stranded? Does it form a circle or is it linear? Is it continuous or is it segmented? Segmented viruses have individual genes on separate uh, strands of nucleic acid. And finally, its size, shape, and symmetry can be used to classify these viruses even further. Now, unlike bacterial classification schemes, the classification of virus doesn't necessarily follow uh, their evolution. Uh, when bacteria are classified close to one another in the same genus, for example, one assumes that they uh, have had a, a common ancestor at some time in the biological past and that they are related. This is not necessarily the case, the case with viruses, as some of these viruses may fall into the same categories because of uh, convergent rather than divergent evolution. So let's look first at uh, categories of RNA viruses. The non-enveloped RNA viruses include those that are single-stranded in the positive sense, and those are the astroviruses, Khaleesi viruses, and coronaviruses, whereas the uh, double-stranded RNA viruses, including rotavirus and rheovirus, tend to have segmented genomes. That is, each of the genes in these viruses is carried on a separate piece of double-stranded RNA. Classification of the enveloped RNA viruses is a little bit more complicated. There are single-stranded positive sense enveloped RNA viruses, including tocoviruses, coronavirus, and flaviviruses. But there are also single-stranded viruses that have negative sense. Now, these viruses can be further subdivided into those that have linear RNA genomes and those that have segmented genomes, and the viral groups are shown below. Finally, there are the retroviruses that fall into this category. They are enveloped RNA viruses, but they are different from all other viruses in that these RNA genomes are converted to DNA and, and imported into the nucleus of the cell during the viral life cycle. This will be discussed further uh, in a later part of the program. Now let's see how some of the viral diseases that I had mentioned uh, in the first part of this uh, lecture relate to the classification of RNA viruses. You can see that polio, most common colds, and hepatitis A fall into the category of single-stranded, positive-stranded, uh, non-enveloped RNA viruses. In fact, all three of these are in the family of picornavirus. Note that the name picornavirus can be broken down into pico, meaning very small, and RNA virus. That's an easy way to remember that the picornaviruses are RNA viruses, and they're very small in size. The yellow fever viruses, hepatitis C and E, fall into the single-stranded, positive-sense enveloped viruses, whereas among the single-stranded negative sense viruses, we have rabies, measles, and influenza. Now, as I mentioned before, the fact that these viruses fall together into this category does not necessarily mean that they are related to one another. Rabies, measles, and influenza could not be more dif different from one another. And finally, as an example of retroviruses, we have the dreaded HIV virus. Now let's look at the classification of the DNA viruses which you will find is very similar. The non-enveloped DNA virus, viruses have genomes that are single-stranded and linear, and as in the case of parvoviruses, double-stranded and linear, as in the case of adenoviruses, 
or double-stranded and circular, as in the case of the papillomaviruses and polyomaviruses. The envelope DNA and viruses include double-stranded linear genomes, as with herpes viruses and pox viruses, or double-stranded circular viruses, such as in the hepadenoviruses. Here's another clue in the name, hepadenovirus. That's a, that's a virus that causes hepatitis B, uh, as indicated by the HEPA at the beginning of its name, and then DNA to indicate that it's a DNA virus. Now some of the diseases that are caused by some of these viruses are listed below. The adenoviruses may cause colds and other types of infections. The herpes viruses cause herpes simplex and chickenpox. And the hepatinovirus, as I've mentioned previously, are associated with hepatitis B. So how do we detect viruses clinically? Well, one way is to recognize the man manifestations of the disease that the virus causes when it is pathognomonic. That is, when it presents in such a way that it's easily recognizable as being caused by that particular virus. Diseases that have very characteristic clinical uh, features uh, from which the diagnosis can be made with almost absolute certainty are measles, chickenpox, and zoster, also known as shingles. Simply looking at the patient and examining the patient will reveal clues that will tell you what the source of the infection is. And it really isn't necessary to do uh, laboratory diagnostic testing in order to confirm these diagnoses. There are also some situations in which histopathology or uh, looking at cells in the light microscope and their abnormalities may give a clue as to what virus is involved. For example, uh, rabies is diagnosed in animals by uh, doing sections of the brains and looking for collections of rabies virus that cause uh, inclusion bodies and in neurons in the cells of uh, infected animals. Similarly, herpes viruses cause cells to fuse so that uh, areas of infection may have giant cells that contain multiple nuclei from multiple cells that have fused together. These uh, features are highly suggestive of those viral infections. It's possible to isolate viruses in culture, but remember, the culture has to include cells because viruses cannot grow outside of cells. Moreover, uh, not all viruses grow in all cell types. So to operate a virology laboratory, it's necessary to have multiple different types of cells available to culture at all times. Many viral infections are diagnosed by serology, that is by looking for the patient's antibody response that is specific to a virus after the infection has been present for some time. Similarly, you can uh, detect the antigens of the virus, often the capsid proteins in clinical samples, or you can detect the genome specifically of a virus in clinical samples using PCR. Although I said that viruses can be grown in tissue culture, remember that they cannot be seen by the light microscope. So one has the problem of trying to determine when a tissue culture is infected with a virus. And what we typically rely on to do that is what is called the cytopathic effect. That is, what is the effect that the virus is having on the host cell? Some viruses may drive their host cell to become necrotic. Some may induce apoptosis. And some may cause the cells to fuse together and form syncytia. Any of these characteristics in a tissue culture can be regarded as a cytopathic effect of the virus, or CPE, and is an indication that the virus is growing in the culture. Alternatively, for those viruses that have minimal CPE, it may be possible to use a fluorescent labeled antibody against the virus to detect it once it started to grow in the culture. In the panel that has just appeared below, you can now see what cytopathic effect looks like in one type of viral infection. Notice that as you go from left to right, what was originally a continuous monolayer of cells on the bottom of the tissue culture plate has started to break up and form holes and eventually the cells have curled up and are dying. This is an example of a cytopathic effect. Sometimes it is useful to quantify the number of viruses in a clinical sample. For example, in following diseases such as hepatitis and HIV, we often quantify the number of viruses in the bloodstream uh, 
and can detect an, an improvement uh, on therapy when the number of viruses goes down. This is usually done using real-time PCR. However, there are other ways to detect and quantify viruses as well. For example, one can use a system of plaque formation. In this case, a tissue culture plate is covered with a monolayer of uh, cells, and uh, viruses in a sample are diluted out and plated uh, on this tissue culture. Once the viruses have been significantly diluted, uh, where each virus falls on the tissue culture, it will start to cause the cells to lyse. If these viruses cause the cells to lyse from the center of where they have fallen, eventually a clear zone inside the uh, tissue culture will develop. Uh, each of these clear zones is called a plaque, and each plaque represents the growth of a single virus, from starting from a single cell and then growing outward. In some cases, it's possible to take advantage of the virus's surface characteristics to use in a quantification scheme. This is possible, for example, with influenza virus, which has a hemagglutinin on its surface. The hemagglutinin on the surface and in the envelope of influenza virus is responsible for binding the virus to uh, target cells and uh, facilitating its uptake. But it also happens to stick to red blood cells and cause them to hemagglutinate when enough viruses are present to cross-link them. In the slide that you see down uh, at the bottom right of, of this uh, picture, uh, influenza virus in various uh, you know, clinical samples has been diluted 1 to 8, 1 to 16, 1 to 32 from left to right in this 96 well plate and added to a solution of red blood cells. Now the plate is made up of wells that have a rounded bottom and when the red cells are not agglutinated they don't stick to the sides of the wells, but rather sediment down into the bottom of the well, causing a visible button to appear. So as you look from the right to the left in these wells, you can see that button in all of the wells in which the virus has been diluted out to a point where it can no longer agglutinate the red blood cells. And then going from left to right, you will see a point at which that button disappears. That's the point at which the red blood cells have been agglutinated and are sticking to the sides of the well. Obviously, those viral samples labeled on the left, one through seven, those samples that contain the most amount of virus will cause the hemagglutination at a greater dilution and will cause the button to appear later and later in the dilution scheme.